All right. Glad that some of you made it to the second to the last presentation of the conference. Large crowd, so I expect you to be extremely rambunctious, right? Make lots of noise. Um, yeah, woo! All right. So uh, my name is Matt Habiger. I am the manager of data science at Pinsight Media. And um, today we're going to talk to you about Project Destiny. And you know, when I think about uh, data and all the analogies around oil, um, you know, data in and of itself, not entirely useful. It's when you apply some processing logic on top of it, and then you, know, you get some, some smart individuals together and think about the products that you can make off of that data, uh, where you go from you know, your oil to gasoline, and then people are kind of the spark that ignite it, right? So um, Project Destiny is, is really uh, Pinsight Media's path to doing that. So a quick blurb about Pinsight Media and what it is that we do, because it's relevant to uh, the data that we get and the project we're going to talk about. So Pinsight Media's whole purpose is helping telecommunications companies monetize their data. You know, typical mobile operator, they're all about selling cell phone plans and servicing customers. Um, but they generate a lot of useful data that is pretty valuable. So uh, Pinsight Media, we ingest a number of different data sources from mobile operators. Uh, the first one, if you think about it, is really uh, CRM data. It's, it's customer data, right? Um, things like the age, the gender, where people live. Uh, that's sort of its most basic um, information. Then there's packet data or web data, right? Web browsing data. So what are all the web pages that people are going to? And then uh, there's another source called location data, network source location data. We're going to talk about that in depth today. Um, and then a data source that Pinsight itself ingests is app intelligence data, which sort of applications individuals are installing on their devices. So that's what Pinsight is all about. Those are the data sources we ingest. And if you think about having those four data sources together, suddenly you can perform, you, you know, you can really get a, a rich understanding of an individual, being able to understand where, how they move about throughout the day and what sort of websites they're going to, the apps that they're interested in. Um, it starts to paint a pretty rich picture. Uh, now, obviously, some of you are probably like, yeah, it's kind of a creepy picture too, right? Um, so Pinsight Media, we we're a wholly owned subsidiary of Sprint. And uh, Sprint, um, you know, we often aren't, aren't lauded in the pages of the Wall Street Journal or um, the, the large newspapers when any of sort of the privacy debates come up around um, you know, use, of, use of data. Uh, there's probably a good reason for that. So Sprint has one of the, um, probably the most you know, restrictive privacy policies in the telecommunications uh, arena. So you know, we're, a lot of carriers might have an opt-in policy or a, yeah, an opt-in policy by default. You know, you're sort of opted in to allowing targeting on this data, um, profiling, uh, sprints the opposite. So you're automatically opted out. The only way that uh, this data can be used at like an individual level to, to target you with ads, let's say, is if you've specifically gone and opted in. So I always like to, to bring that up and let people know about that. So uh, how many of you were in the keynote on Wednesday? All right, so video might look familiar. Um, my boss, Kevin McGinnis, he played this. And you know, Project Destiny is sort of the, the origination of this video. So the blue dots are supposed to be a depiction of network source location data. Um, and I'll go into a little bit of detail about that. The red line is supposed to be a depiction of potentially a route that you would say somebody took to go from home to work if you had data source from, let's say, applications on a device, right? As uh, a user uses an application at home, a weather app to see what the weather is going to be, they get to work and they arrive, they open up another app, you might end up with two events, one that places them at home, one that places them at work. And the question is, how did they go from point A to point B? Uh, the unique thing about network-based location data is it's 
pretty persistent, right? Your cell phone is always attempting to connect to towers, to cell phone towers. Um, and as it does that, it throws off essentially uh, signals that allow us to perform some algorithms to say, okay, we think the person is here. Now they've moved to the next location. Um, so using information about where the towers are located and metadata from the device that's collected, we're able to you know, essentially estimate where we think you are in space and time. So what we're trying to do with Project Destiny is we have a lot of this data coming in. In fact, we've got you know, tens of billions of records every single day. Um, the question is, all right, what can we do that's useful with this data? Um, and you know, that's always the big question when it comes to, to big data, right? So you got all this data coming in, how do you productize it? Um, so Project Destiny is about leveraging that location data in the out of home space. Out of home, who's familiar with out of home advertising? All right, it's just a fancy way to say billboards um, or you know, signage on a bus stop or on the side of a bus or in a subway station, right? So that's, that's the out of home industry. And if you think about the out of home industry, um, they, they've sort of suffered a long, for a long time in trying to really do attribution, right? And trying to count impressions. So if you're familiar with the digital advertising space, digital advertising is you know, highly measurable, right? There's pixel trackers everywhere. Every uh, web page, every landing page, inside of applications, everything has tracking embedded inside of it. Out of home, um, not so much, right? It's fairly hard to, to identify who drove by a billboard at 9 a.m. Um, and so for that industry to continue to, main rel to remain relevant, you know, they're looking to figure out how do they modernize and how do they, how do they figure out how they can start to compete with other forms of advertising that are getting better and better at uh, you know, essentially proving their value. So um, this all started, this journey started with you know, a simple introduction. So our boss, Kevin McGinnis, he happened to know a guy that owned several billboards in the small market. And uh, he was talking to him and, and, and the guy said, you know, it would really be great if when I go and I pitch to brands, um, I go and I pitch to companies to say, hey, you should, at, you should you know, buy, buy a placement on our billboard. Um, I could tell them more than just, here's how many cars drove by this location on an average day over the course of the year, right? So typical measurement that you would have in this, this industry is a traffic count for uh, what they call a, an average annual daily traffic count, right? It's, it's how many cars we think drove, bought, drove drive on this road over the course of a day. Um, a nut, so, you know, kind of lacks a lot of information. Hey, it'd be nice to know by hour how many cars are going by, right? Um, and if you think about like census data, uh, that's lots of times the way that out of home operators try to say, here's the likely um, set of individuals that you know, you'll be reaching if you buy this, buy this placement. So real dearth of information in this space and uh, you know, we figured with the data that we had, we could probably do something quite, quite a bit richer. So just to show you what this test looked like um, at, a, at a zoomed out high level. So it was a market near uh, Springfield, Missouri. There were three billboards and um, you know, the main things that this billboard operator wanted to see was he wanted to understand catchment area. Right. Catchment is, areas are essentially where are people coming from that are going by a billboard. So are they driving from 10 miles away, 30 miles away, a block away, right? What type of individuals am I reaching? What's the population that's primarily seeing um, my billboard? The other things that he wanted to be able to see is date parting. Um, so he wanted to know at 10 a.m., or you know, 8 to 10 a.m., the morning commute, who's driving by my boards? And then how about midday, 
and then the afternoon, right? During those different time periods, who's driving by? Um, what are their demographics? What's the impression count? How many people are driving by? And so we took our location data and um, you know, didn't have a whole lot of time with this one. It was sort of our, uh, our alpha test, right? We're, we're gonna fail fast with this one and figure out, okay, could we actually, could we generate some, some useful insights for this one operator? And if so, we'll, we'll continue to develop. And so, um, you know, we did some basic vector calculations and some bearing calculations to say, okay, you know, you're traveling um, down, you, you travel from one point to the next point and we think your, you know, your bearing is 80 degrees and you're three tenths of a mile from a billboard, great, we're gonna call that an, an impression. So it's sort of uh, pretty raw compared to what Prosh is gonna jump into and show you um, for what we do today. But we put together this report for the operator and I feel like his, his quote sort of says it all and really started us down this journey, which was he had never seen anything like what we were able to provide him, right? Being able to understand the demographic breakdown for individuals by time of day, and also understanding additional behaviors uh, that those individuals had was, was sort of mind blowing for them. So, so that's how we got into this. Um, and from there, it just sort of snowballed, right? We talked to additional billboard operators, we started talking to national billboard operators, and they all said the same thing was, which was, you know, you guys have sort of a gold mine of data here um, and it's something that can really revolutionize our industry. So, uh, what you guys are all here for though, is not quotes, you're like, how do you do it, right? Show us. And so, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Prosh, and he's gonna walk through some of the technical details on how we actually take the raw location data and process it and uh, create some, something valuable out of it. So. One, uh, one final note before I turn it over to Prosh. This is his first public speaking event, so you guys can give him a round of applause before he starts. Hello everyone, so like Matt said, this is the first time I'm speaking at a technical conference, so pretty excited, at the same time nervous as well, so I'm going to keep it short. Uh, so before before getting into the details, a little intro into what actually what we actually receive from Sprint. Uh, we receive about 20 billion raw location records uh, from uh, tens of millions of devices, and not all these devices ping at a pre, at a you know a fixed time interval. So as a result, for some devices we may see as many as uh, 10,000 records, and for some devices we may see only a couple of hundred records. So our first step in the pre-processing pipeline is uh, to resample these records uh, with a different time interval so that we reduce the number of records we work with. And if you were to plot uh, the, record, raw, the resampled records for a single user on a map, this is how it looks. So, I mean, this is a macro view and you can clearly see that the user traveled somewhere in Kansas City, uh, close to Chicago. And this is, it, the data looks good when you actually see it in a macro view but when you zoom in, you see that some of these records are very, very close to each other. And our next step in the pre-processing pipeline is to cluster these records that are very, very close to each other uh, using a density-based clustering algorithm called dbscan. Uh, it basically groups uh, the points that are very close to each other. At the same time, this algorithm helps us to uh, drop any outliers that are there in this data set. And once we cluster these records, uh, this is how it looks. So all the blue dots that you see on the left versus the green dots that you see on the right, they belong to different clusters. So instead of working with the raw records, we now work with uh, clusters. And as you can see, we draw a convex hull around these points, and the convex hull kind of represents uh, a polygon or an area where the user is. And instead of working with these raw records, like I said, we work with these polygons, or we call it locations, and these locations could be either polygons or line strings uh, based on the, the number of points that are there in this, uh, the, the number of points that are there in this cluster. So like I said, we, we drop these raw records 
and arrange these uh, locations based on uh, the timestamps that we see on raw records. And our next step is we look at the centroids of these locations and hit OSRM, which is an open source routing machine, which basically gives what is the most probable route uh, the user can take between the between two points. And uh, the green line you sh uh, that you can see on this map is uh, the most probable route between these two points. So this kind of a zoomed in view. When you actually zoom out, you see a bunch of different uh, locations for this user. And not only do we see uh, the raw loca uh, the location geometries, but we also see the amount of time the user spent at each of these locations. For example, there are a couple of locations in Kansas City where the user spent 600 minutes from uh, the start of the day. And then he started his travel to Chicago. And then he took a couple of pitch stops where he spent 10 minutes and five minutes. So uh, after we also draw up a couple, some of these locations as just waypoints based on uh, the amount of time the user spends at those locations and as well as the time it takes to travel between locations. And our locations are not as big as what you see on the screen. We just made them bigger so that you can actually see them on the slides. And we also label these locations as a home location or work location uh, using a rule-based algorithm. Uh, we also layer in census data to do that. And the whole point of doing this is uh, to identify whether or not a user passed by a billboard. And if he did, at what time did he pass by that billboard? Uh, as you can see, uh, there is a small yellow circle, or actually a big one. Uh, that yellow circle defines uh, the kind of view shared for this billboard. So anyone who is in that yellow circle can actually see that billboard. And again, we made that circle bigger so that you can see it. And we match uh, the routes that we generated for the users with, the, uh, with these view sheds or circles and then uh, see whether or not they passed by a billboard. And as you can see, the user passed by this billboard at approximately 8 a.m. And like Matt said, not only do we know uh, the time, but we also know the additional, additional information about the user, such as uh, his age, gender, and additional behavioral information about the user. So we can link back all that information and provide uh, out-of-home advertisers with a rich view of who is actually viewing their ads. And that is all the pre-processing that we do for a single user. And to scale it up, we leverage Spark and Hive. Uh, our DMP team lands most of these raw records into Hive. And in Hive, we aggregate these records by device and then filter these, uh, filter some of these devices for privacy reasons, for example, government record, government devices. And then we run our pre-processing pipeline in Spark where we, where we do all the steps that I just mentioned and hit several OSRM servers to get the routes uh, the users took. And we also get a couple of million of POIs or billboards from uh, our external, our, from our clients and we match those routes to these POIs using route matching algorithms. And we store all of these files in, as Parquet in HDFS. And after, after uh, we generate aggregated reports for out-of-home advertisers uh, based on these results. Uh, point of interest, in this case, billboards. Okay. Yeah. So we thought it would be cool to match all the routes that we generated and map it to uh, major US roads and see how the traffic looks by R. And this is, uh, this is the plot that we generated for R0. So as you can see, it's pretty much light. And this is for R7, it's, it's a little red. R12, completely red. And same for R18 and for R23. So and as you can see, we have some missing records for some of these states. And we, we did not have those records for that particular day. It's not that Sprint doesn't have coverage. Uh, Sprint has coverage almost all of US. So with that, I'm turning over to Matt. All right. Uh, oh, thank you. Thanks, Prash. Um, so you know, I think when you look at these maps that Prash showed you, like it's pretty powerful at the end of the day what happens with the data. So you get billions and billions of raw records in, Whichever we were to plot that, it would just, you know, look like the whole US filled up. Um, but then when you actually apply a processing over the top of it, 
suddenly you can get to something that's comprehensible, right, and, and actually really usable. So we take raw records, we run it through a pipeline, um, Prosh undersold the difficulty of it. There's a lot that goes into, you know, uh, on his, his sort of tech stack slide that goes into to really um, making this all run across, you know, billions of records a day and, and generating these routes. But what you end up with at the end of it is something pretty powerful. It's essentially, you know, what does traffic look like across the U.S. Um, on, you know, pretty much any given road? Um, probably not like small mountain roads, but, you know, at least all the major major cities, uh, any major metropolitan area, and probably the major uh, routes to go between those. So, um, you know, I started off this talk talking about the use case without a home advertiser and, and talking about Randy and, and his quote and, uh, you know, tying this data back to um, the additional data sets that, that Pinsight has access to. So what I wanted to show you guys specifically is an example of, of one, one street and uh, what sort of data we would see to provide a, a real rich view for an out-of-home advertiser. Um, so this is a street in uh, Kansas City. Uh, actually, it's in Overland Park, just, just south of Kansas City. And uh, basically what I'm showing here is on the top left, it is traffic counts for that street over the, the, the day, right? This is a, a Saturday in April, and um, as you can see, it sort of peaks at uh, the 17th hour, 5 p.m., and starts to drop off. You know, one of the things that, that uh, one of the problems that we face in this space is there's not really anybody doing this. And so, um, you know, what we're always trying to figure out is, how do we measure ourselves? Do we think that we're doing a good job, um, especially when you know the scope of the problem is is the whole U.S. Um, and there's you know millions and millions of roads in the U.S. So one of the things that we've sort of used to just initially eyeball and see whether or not our counts look correct is uh, you know Google. Google's a nice a nice uh, company to benchmark yourself off of, and if you tend to look at the locations of um, different, uh, you know, retailers and businesses on that street, and you look at it on a Saturday, and, you know, you're probably all familiar with the, hey, how busy is this location? Um, our plots look exactly the same. So we tend to think that, at least right now, it looks like we're doing something right. Um, if we look at the highlighted hours, I've got eight and uh, 20, so 8 a.m. and 10 p.m. highlighted. And just wanted to show you how the demographic makeup starts to change between those, those two time periods. So if we were to look at a distribution of age, um, who's driving by at 8 a.m. in the morning on that particular road, who's driving by at 10 p.m. Um, you know, it's a Saturday night, and so at 10 p.m. you see a spike happen in the 18 to 24 uh, crowd. And, you know, you also don't see the fall off um, in the older age groups. So that's kind of interesting. There's a lot of uh, restaurants in that area. And so hypothesis might be that, hey, this is, uh, you know, older couples going out to dinner. Um, so that's cool. We got, we got age down, right? We can, we can start to now differentiate between um, what age groups are actually out and about traveling down that road. So that helps advertisers a little bit. Uh, it's a little more interesting when you can start layering on sort of behavioral information. Um, so we pulled some information on the applications that people had installed on their devices to understand, okay, what can that tell us about the types of individuals that are, are driving down that road at uh, 8 a.m. in the morning and 10 p.m. at night? Um, anybody know what the M is, that icon is? Now, it looks a lot like Meetup. I thought it was Meetup, too. Now, it's actually Marshalls. Uh, Marshalls is, you know, kind of a discount retailer. Uh, Planet Fitness, WhatsApp, and Excel. Although, the interesting thing is, it wasn't actually Excel. Well, it was Excel, but it was the 
uh, Spanish language version of the app. And there were several other Spanish language versions of apps that over-indexed in the 8 a.m. crowd. And so suddenly now you start to see that, hey, it's, you know, a, uh, a, a different subset of the population that's driving down at 8 a.m. on a Saturday on this, this route, you know. You might, if, if you had a di digital billboard, you might tailor uh, Hispanic ads, right, Spanish language ads in uh, the early morning. And then as you get to 10 p.m., you see a different subset, all right? Suddenly, um, there's a couple music apps. There's like SoundCloud, um, Amazon. We see Credit Karma, which is, you know, credit, uh, an app for checking your, your, your credit score, Weatherbug, and a soccer app. Um, so a different population that we start to see at 10 p.m. And so, you know, there's additional information we can layer on, like website information, understand what websites people are going to, retailers, uh, retail sites that they might be, be using. But this sort of view, being able to understand, okay, who's traveling down, down a road at a particular time um, is really where the industry is trying to go. And if you think about billboards, uh, you've probably seen a change over the last 10 years, right? It's not just these huge sheets of um, plastic that are, you know, tapered over a, over a, a wooden billboard, but now you see digital boards, right? And they change. Um, the billboard industry is, is quickly moving to, to programmatic, right? They're moving to the path of um, all things digital. And so, you know, if, if you have the ability to put this type of intelligence into uh, a programmatic platform and allow brands to understand a little bit more about who's driving by a board at a particular time. Um, now suddenly, Target or Walmart or you know Marshalls can say, "Great, I want to buy a 15-second placement or a one-minute placement on 75th Street um, in you know Overland Park at 8 a.m." And that starts to revolutionize the way that billboard advertising is bought. So we think it's pretty powerful. And uh, with that, I will turn it over to questions. So I see you've got a Jupiter uh, sticker on your laptop. Uh, oh, we got, uh, oh. if you would wait for a second so they could give you the mic. Okay. But, yeah. So there's some hardcore data analytics going on here. Um, were you using a notebook uh, tool to help with that, or were you using just coding, or like Visual Studio, or um, like what are your best practices from playing around with this much sophisticated data? Uh, we mostly use PySpark to do it. So like, like you said, we use notebooks to kind of do the development. And once we do it, we run Spark submit jobs to actually uh, do the entire pre-processing pipeline. So a quick question on uh, when you take the data points of the people traveling, so is it uh, ideally the Sprint customers, is just the Sprint customers, or if you're just taking the whole, uh, everyone traveling on that area? Um, so it would be anybody on the Sprint network. So yeah. do you extrapolate it for you know generalizing to the whole population? Yeah, yes. So when we do um, like estimates for a particular road segment, mm -hmm. the request is, typically to do an extrapolation to the whole population. And that's where, like as Prosh talked about, understanding where users' home locations are and where we, we think they actually live, that allows us then to, using that information along with some census estimates, we do estimates up to the whole population. Okay, thank you. Couple of questions. Uh, how much data are we talking about? What was the time period? I may have missed it right in the beginning if you said that. Um, so like the, the specific um, graphs that like Prosh showed were just at a day level, but we essentially process this for, you know, I think we have, call it 18 months worth of data. So um, 18 have, months every day 
every day. day. So on a daily basis, take all of the location events we have and we batch process them um, and generate these routes. And uh, you mentioned programmatic uh, for billboards. Um, I do understand how you're getting the information back to the advertisers, but there isn't really a way to tell that if I drove by that place, I actually did see the ad, right? So Correct. this is, this yeah. is really a, an approximation. We just know that people pass by. Yep. If they were paying attention to the road, they may not have seen the ad at all. Yes. So yeah. is, there, is there a correlation with the ad? Is there, are these guys doing something uh, so that they actually know if somebody saw it and interacted with it? Um, that is a good question. I'm, you know, technically I'm not sure if they're, uh, what, what they're attempting to do to actually say, okay, we know that you at least were in the, uh, the vicinity to see the ad. You had the potential to be an impression, if you will, right? Um, I don't know that they're, they're trying to solve down to the level of, yes, this person actually did view the ad. Um, there's certainly, we've had questions of, hey, you know, we've got web browsing data, and so you could see if somebody went to a website after um, actually driving by an ad that had, hey, visit, you know, xyz.com. Um, so in those instances, we could do uh, some inference on it, but again, it's, it's never, never will probably be to the level where you can actually, you know, identify, yeah, that, that person looked up at the billboard. So um, I, I will say they do quite a bit of stuff with, or the industry is trying to do a lot of stuff with like videos mounted on billboards, video cameras, and recording, um, you know, as people are driving by. So, um, so I had a question about the um, uh, how effective the billboards are. So, since you can track where people are at a given point in time, even with extrapolation. Have you done correlations between um, they passed this billboard and a lot of them went to Dunkin' Donuts maybe? It was a Dunkin' Donuts billboard. Do you do any metrics on those? Yeah, we, we've, we've had requests to do attribution. Um, you know, Prash, Prash uh, didn't, didn't uh, go into a whole lot of detail on this one, but you know, network-based location data, well, it's not bad on its accuracy. You're talking maybe 200 meters, 300 meters uh, on average that, that it could be off. Um, it's not really to the level where I would say you could, you could do um, attribution for did somebody actually go into Dunkin' Donuts, right? A, a fine, um, small retail location. But with something larger, like did they go to this mall or, um, you know, a store that had a larger footprint, then I would say we're probably there with the, the network data. But um, yeah, a lot of it, you really probably would have to go to GPS-based data to, to do that type of attribution. So in a rural area, it's pretty easy to map easy, I mean, to use that yeah. generically, but it's um, logical that you would be on a particular highway versus, you know, the service road or right. the, the cow path next to it. But in an urban area, um, do you have difficulty f um, attributing to a particular street uh, with the cellular tower density that you have? Yeah, so um, that's definitely one of the things that we're working on right now is um, trying to understand just how accurate we are when it comes to service road versus, you know, freeway. Um, we have we have a source of GPS data on a number of devices, and so we're trying to test that and understand right now just how accurate we are. Um, the, I will say the the one good thing about a lot of the the billboards that we get is that um, typically they are viewable from either the service road or the freeway. And so in those instances, lots of times like the, the view shed or the POI that we talk about includes both of those um, lanes, if you will. What about in a more urban area, like uh, where the streets are closer together? Yeah. You can only see something from one street and not the other. Right, right, yeah. And in those instances, then that's, you know, that's where the measurement uh, gets more difficult and we're, um, right now we're trying to understand just how accurate are we.
All right, if there's no other questions, uh, thank you for your time.